Greetings. I am Walt Bauer, and I'd like to welcome you to the Human Development Institute's third spring seminar. My short visual description is, I am a white male wearing glasses with hazel eyes and a blue and white patterned shirt with a collar. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm sitting in front of a virtual background. My virtual background is a three-story brick academic building that has offices for the Human Development Institute on the University of Kentucky campus. The sun is shining next to the brick building. We welcome all the participants who are joining us today. Our presenters will provide an opportunity for questions today, and we welcome questions from all of our participants. Please type your questions for our speakers in the Q&A box for a robust question and answer session. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see the Q&A option. Please use the chat, bot, chat box for technical questions. You are joining the webinar on mute. There is not a participant video in the webinar room. We have live captioning for the webinar in the closed captioning feature. Turn on the captioning by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and then clicking show subtitle. Should you have any questions about CEUs, you can contact me. My email address is walt.bauer at uky.edu. Again, that is walt, W-A-L-T dot Bauer, B-O-W-E-R at uky.edu. Please take a moment at the conclusion of the webinar to complete our brief evaluation. The evaluation will be sent to your email address after the webinar. It is really helpful as we plan for upcoming webinars. The title of the webinar is Developmental Disability and the Criminal Justice System, Challenges and Pitfalls. It's a pleasure and a privilege to introduce our speakers this afternoon. Dr. Weiga is a professor of psychology and director of clinical training in the doctoral program in clinical psychology at Eastern Kentucky University. Dr. Weigand's research focuses on psychopathology and psychological assessment in forensic assessment. Dr. Bundy is a professor of psychology and coordinator of the Applied Behavioral Analysis Program at Eastern Kentucky University. Dr. Bundy's work is focused on assessing and supporting people with developmental disabilities, particularly ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. I'm now going to turn it over to our presenters. Well, thank you so much, Walt, for that gracious introduction, and uh, we are thrilled to be here. Looks like we have 97. The numbers keep going up, um, Myra Bath. So, uh, my name is Dustin Wygant, and as Walt said, I'm a professor of psychology at EKU, and I'm also a licensed psychologist here in Kentucky as well as in Ohio. And uh, my colleague and I are going to spend some time talking to you today about uh, the work that we've done uh, in the criminal justice system. Since I got to Kentucky in 2009, I have uh, worked as a um, psychologist, and my clinical work has been in the area of, of completing forensic psychological evaluations for the courts. And uh, I, I will say I don't have a lot of exposure or experience to autism spectrum disorder, uh, but I know someone who does, and, and she's right next to me here on the Zoom screen. And um, I, But I have worked a lot with uh, criminal defendants who have... Uh, have an intellectual disability. And so, I don't know, a number of years ago, Dr. Bundy and I worked on a case together for the courts in Louisville, where this question about autism uh, came up. And ever since then, we've had this uh, kind of really awesome partnership where we've done a lot of forensic cases together. Dr. Bundy, you want to say anything about our uh, partnership over the years? Yeah, I think you'll see what it's like when you see our work here today. Dr. Weigand knows so much about forensic psychology and legal procedures. Um, I love to work with people with developmental special needs. And really, he is really, he undersells himself on what he knows about autism, because I, I don't think he and I have ever disagreed about a diagnosis, right, or about uh, a forensic opinion related to autism. 
So we, we love to see folks together, enjoy meeting them, uh, work with their attorneys or the courts to, uh, to do some of the tasks we're going to teach you about today. Right. I'm, I was going to describe both of us. If, is that okay if I describe you, Dr. Wigand? This should be fun. This will be great. Yeah. Go so, ahead. so I, I'm a, a late middle-aged uh, white female, shoulder length hair, goofy grin, usually on my face. And behind my background has photographs of some of my travels around the world, which makes me really happy. And Dr. Wigand is a younger middle-aged bald guy, uh, white guy. And he's got some of his special interests in his background too. I can see a guitar sticking up there and he's got a sleeping dog back behind him. That's our silent, we hope that's our silent co-presenter. Exactly. So we're happy to be here with you today. And I think Dr. Wigand is going to bring up some presentation slides. Yes, thank you, Myra Beth. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share. Um, wanna make sure, can everyone, we, can we, we see? Yeah. We can see it, we can see Excellent. it, perfect. Thank you so much, Walt, appreciate it. So again, as a reminder, we're gonna talk about the ways in which developmental disabilities and individuals impacted by them um, interact with the criminal justice system. We're hopeful that today will help you understand some legal concepts that um, are often used when talking about legal proceedings, things like competency, insanity, uh, mitigation, Miranda, and we really want to make sure that you understand these different terms because they actually um, speak to different ways in which individuals with developmental disabilities can be impacted and at different stages in the criminal justice system the, from, from the time an alleged offense occurs to the arrest to before the trial, during the trial, and after the trial when if the person's found guilty and the court has to think about sentencing matters. So we're hoping that we can really expand upon and your knowledge of these different legal concepts throughout the uh, legal proceedings. Um, we also wanna give you a sense of how psychologists evaluate criminal defendants uh, who have developmental disabilities. We'll talk a little bit about that. And, and actually we've come up with some uh, case examples and these are, these are actual cases that Dr. Bundy and I've worked on. I think in almost every case, I, I think actually in every one of the cases, we have both seen the individual and in, and in a number of them, we've worked together directly on those cases. The only thing that I will ask, of course, we're not gonna reveal any uh, overly uh, identifying information, but still all these cases involve you know, real people um, and there's some sensitivity about that. We only bring them up to really highlight and illustrate some of the points that we're making, but we would ask that you be respectful of, of the details of these cases um, outside of this uh, workshop. So yeah, I think that basically covers what we're going to talk about today. And I think it's really important as we begin to understand differences between um, forensic mental health assessment and what may, many of you may be familiar with in terms of uh, traditional clinical assessment. And so there are some pretty important distinctions. And I think it's important to start off by going over some of those. So forensic mental health assessment is, is a psychological or sometimes done by a psychiatrist, psychiatric assessment that is performed in the legal system for the purposes of helping the courts um, deal with some matter before them. So the language that lawyers use is to assist the court in understanding a uh, fact or question at hand or an issue uh, before the court. And this is really different from um, therapeutic assessment, uh, which is done to provide, you know, to assess symptoms and guide intervention planning. Dr. Bundy, do you want to say anything about kind of the, the contrasted clinical assessment as it pertains to individuals with developmental disabilities? Sure. Well, a clinical assessment is usually requested by the person or by the, the person and or their family. Um, the person and or their family may have a goal in mind with the assessment. It could be uh, eligibility for services, um, ideas about supports or services moving forward. They're trying to 
maybe meet a goal in their life and somehow the evaluation will help them move toward this goal. The information in the, that comes out of the evaluation is owned by them, right? The person, right. Um, and they can use it or not as they see fit. And that's quite different from the way this happens in yeah. uh, forensic matters. Yeah, and I'll say a little bit more about that. But, you know, in, in a lot of ways, though, the clinical methodology is not that dissimilar, right? So the tests we use in forensic settings mostly are uh, clinical assessment instruments. And we'll, we'll say a little bit more about those. In fact, we'll say a little bit about those right now. Um, for those of you who are psychologists in the audience or those who work uh, with individuals with developmental disabilities, you'll probably be maybe familiar with some of these tests, but really uh, uh, psychologists heavily rely on psychometric me uh, measures like these psychological tests. They play in a particularly important role in cases uh, involving defendants who might have a developmental disability. And the reason behind that is that um, a lot of these conditions uh, need to be kind of sussed out with these clinical objective measures. So we have things like IQ tests, uh, which ob obviously plays an important role in, in assessing uh, an, an, an intellectual disability. Uh, but we also have measures of adaptive functioning, which adaptive functioning and, and the ability to kind of navigate things um, actually becomes a really important construct when we think about the person navigating the criminal justice system. Achievement measures can be used um, to kind of look at um, academic functioning. When we think about maybe an individual's ability to read and their, their reading level, that might become really crucial and important uh, when we think about re reviewing written materials, let's say a, a Miranda warning that's presented to a suspect um, it's important to understand, you know, whether that individuals would have the reading ability to, to really understand that. And then, of course, Dr. Bundy, you want to say anything about autism measures and why they become important in uh, these forensic assessments? They could be important because the court or some, you know, some involved party may want to know whether a specific diagnosis is accurate or exists. So if the court wants to know um, or wants proof, that autism seems to be a reasonable diagnosis for somebody that's involved in legal proceedings, then we would use measures to try to ascertain that. Yeah. One of the big distinctions and, and one that we're actually going to spend some time talking about as we go through this talk is this really important notion here in the second set of bullets here, which is that when you think about what a psychologist is doing in a psychological evaluation, we're often forming clinical and diagnostic impressions. And as I indicated earlier, a lot of those impressions can be heavily influenced by psychological test results. Now, the important feature though, that really can't be underscored enough in forensic mental health assessment, there has to be an explicit link between those diagnostic and clinical findings, the psychological test results and the forensic issue before the court. So whether an individual has an intellectual disability or is on the autism spectrum, that's only relevant to the degree that it impacts the specific forensic issue that the court is investigating. So, and I'm not gonna give you the answers here yet to these two, we're actually gonna kind of flesh these out as we go along, but you know, how would someone with an intellectual disability, how, how would that impact their competency to stand trial? You know, so what that involves, and we're going to get to that later when we, when we get to the kind of pretrial stage of involvement, we're thinking about how an intellectual disability might impact someone's ability to navigate that trial situation. Um, if we're going to think about autism spectrum disorder and criminal responsibility, which is a more colloquially referred to as the insanity defense, you know, how could symptoms of ASD impact an individual's appreciation of their behavior at the time of an alleged offense. And so that really becomes the connection between what has to be established in the assessment, which are these clinical diagnostic impressions test results, and then the forensic issue uh, before the court. Dr. And I thought of another one yeah. that we probably should have put on there, which is um, how does an intellectual developmental disability, you know, diagnosis 
impact eligibility for execution, right? Obviously, that's a huge one. After yeah. the Atkins v. Virginia case in the early 2000s, that has established that um, individuals with an intellectual disability um, cannot be um, given the death penalty. So yeah, that's, and that's actually, when that case came uh, all the way up to the Supreme Court, it raised the stakes. I mean, what could be more impactful in terms of stakes than, than the capital type of crime and punishment, but it also really um, drove home the need to do thorough assessments uh, of individuals suspected of having intellectual disability and other developmental disabilities when it comes to their uh, involvement in the legal system. So just kind of going back and, and <clears throat> making sure that we underscore these points, there are some really profound differences between clinical assessment and forensic mental health assessment. Number one, the role that the clinician plays is fundamentally different. And that difference sets a tone that's very different between a clinical assessment uh, that may be done for establishing diagnostic impressions to look for interventions or establish accommodations versus a clinician answering a psycholegal question. So that is a question before the court, a legal matter that has some psychological or psychiatric uh, relevance. So for example, when we think about competency to stand trial, incompetency is at, at its root has to be connected to what's called a mental condition, which different states and jurisdictions will use terms like mental condition, mental disease or defect. These are codified languages in our legal code and our, our legal statutes that uh, make at a minimum that the individual has to have that condition in order for the remaining parts of the statute to kick in. So you can't be incompetent unless you're incompetent because of a mental condition. You can't be insane at the time of the offense unless you have a mental condition that resulted in that insanity. So th those are things that we'll cover as we go on. And Dr. Bundy, you had mentioned earlier this, this idea of who is the client <clears throat> is different, right? So in a clinical setting, it's the individual seeking services or perhaps their family if we're working with a, a minor, right? And so um, that establishes this, this kind of, you know, fiduciary responsibility between the clinician and, and those looking for services. That means that the record is their medical record. It obviously is protected by HIPAA. Um, it can be used for seeking accommodations, treatment, um, but in a forensic assessment, the client is actually the referring party for the evaluation. And it's uh, actually not permissible for a person, um, the defendant, him or herself, to hire the uh, forensic clinician. It actually has to be initiated through either their legal counsel or uh, occasionally by the court, by the judge. Um, by the prosecution even can uh, request these evaluations. And so the client is not the defendant, not the person getting evaluated. In fact, a lot of times they're referred to as the evaluee, the individual undergoing the evaluation, whereas the client is the, um, you know, the, the lawyer or the court. And, and that, that does set up some differences um, in that, uh, confidentiality, which is, you know, established and paramount in, in clinical settings, uh, is different in a forensic setting where the um, statements made during the evaluation will often emerge in court. They will be written in reports. Those reports will be sent to the judge, the, uh, the prosecuting and defense attorneys, and that psychologist may make statements in, in open court about their findings. And there are some exceptions afforded to experts when providing expert testimony that normally would not be afforded to people uh, serving as witnesses in court. So many of you may be familiar with the concept of, um, you know, people in court have to share information that they have direct knowledge of and anything else is referred to as, as, as hearsay. 
Well, there's exceptions for hearsay for medical and, and psychological doctors providing expert testimony because we're allowed to do that because we use statements generated by the people that we interview and collateral sources in order to form these diagnostic impressions. So we actually get a little bit more latitude in relaying information to the court than the typical witness. And so all of this essentially goes to number three and it, it actually sets up some different dynamics between the clinician and what we think of as the client, the person you know, that we evaluate. Again, in this um, setting, we really kind of refer to them more as the evaluee. Whereas in a um, you know, forensic setting, we need to have an objective neutral stance. And Dr. Bundy, you want to say something about the differences between that and, and more of the advocacy therapeutic stance that's taken on in clinical settings? Yeah, I think you've covered it adequately. Um, and, and I guess I would just say that we have to be really careful when we're getting informed consent when we're working in this situation so that people understand that we are not, quote, their doctor or providing treatment for them, but rather we're working for the legal system and ethically we're bound to present our results to the person that sought our services. Yeah, exactly. All of this puts on what I refer to as demand characteristics for that evaluation. And I think it's important for people like Dr. Bundy and myself and, and any of the psychologists or, or trainees in the audience to know that it is not easy to be someone undergoing an evaluation in a forensic setting. And I, you know, my Beth, I know you and I have talked about this. We've, it's, it's part of, even though we're neutral and objective, it's not like we're unempathetic towards the people that we're working with. And so you have to appreciate that for these individuals, they're facing, some of them are facing very serious uh, criminal charges. I mean, Dr. Bundy and I have, have worked on numerous murder cases uh, sexual assault cases, um, you know, uh, those types of cases where the stakes are really high. The folks that we're working with are in jail. Jails are not great places. They're really not great places for people who have intellectual disabilities. You think about sensory, you know, issues and, and you know, all, all the stuff that I think Dr. Bundy will talk a little bit more about later. Uh, those things can really compound the impact of, of incarceration for individuals who have developmental disabilities. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, we just have to be mindful that, you know, what we get with people when we're working with them can be impacted not only by a developmental disability, but simply by being in jail and facing very serious charges. And that, that, that can really impact, uh, you know, these individuals. The last thing I, I note here is response style. And that's an interesting dynamic that has to be evaluated in forensic settings. So what I'm getting at when I note response style is how the individual is responding, particularly during clinical interviews and on psychological tests. If you think about measures that we use, measures that we just talked about, like IQ measures, for example, those measures are set up by examining um, essentially the ceiling. So we, we ask a series of questions or give the individual a series of tasks, whether it's block design or you know, number kind of questions, verbal types of questions. And the way that those measures work is we expect that the individual will work as hard as they can and wherever they reach in terms of the number of items correct, that ceiling establishes their performance level. But as I just indicated, the assumption is that the individual tries their hardest. They have to put forth enough effort to give a valid um, you know, response uh, in terms of establishing things like IQ level. And so it becomes extremely important in forensic settings to ascertain this using objective methods. So there are a number of tests that psychologists use to look at how the individual approach the test. And we have this concept called malingering, which essentially gets at 
someone feigning deficits that may not be there or over-reporting uh, deficits or underperforming on cognitive measures in order to appear more impaired than the individual might actually be. And, and estimates in the literature range between 20 and 30% of defendants in criminal cases undergoing forensic evaluations show at least some evidence of response bias and potentially outright malingering. And there have been a number of cases, some cases that have made the media where individuals um, have feigned an intellectual disability in order to be found either incompetent for the uh, trial or to be found not criminally responsible. So this is a, a really important issue that has to be examined in forensic assessments. So we're gonna talk about uh, really five different uh, ways or, or stages, let's say, at which an individual might uh, you know, encounter a forensic issue that would later be examined for a trial. And so I may, maybe I should have um, rearranged this. If you start actually in the middle column, how about that? Um, we're really starting with number one here is getting at when the offense actually occurred or as until anyone's convicted, the alleged offense actually occurred. Um, at that point, there, is, uh, there can be an examination of the individual's criminal responsibility. Were they criminally responsible during the commission of the alleged offense? And the hope here is that if they are not criminally responsible, again, affording to a uh, mental condition, that evidence can be examined before the trial, but then it's actually presented during the trial with the purpose of the defense getting a specific jury instruction. So this is something that a, a trier of fact, the jury would have to uh, examine. And so uh, if the defense is successful in presenting evidence uh, of an insanity defense, then that would be presented as a jury instruction. So that the jury would retire to the jury room, but before that, the judge would say, okay, here's the offense. Let me tell you what the offense is. Here are the possible findings. Guilty, what does guilty mean? Not guilty, what does not guilty mean? And then not guilty by reason of insanity. And so the judge would actually read that jury instruction so that the jury would have that as an option in deciding the outcome of the case. Now that of course seems like the end of a trial and it is, but that's actually something time-wise that actually goes back to when the uh, offense actually occurs. If we think about the next step in this process after an offense occurs, when the police arrest the individual or they uh, apprehend a suspect, they will often ask that individual questions. Um, but beforehand, since the 1960s, we have had this landmark Supreme Court case called, um, you know, that, that involves the Miranda warning. Um, and that Miranda warning basically is the, the warning that you've probably seen on television shows. You have the right to remain silent, that sort of stuff. Well, sometimes people will waive their Miranda rights for silence, but not fully appreciate what that means. And so, um, if they fail to waive their, if they do, I'm, I'm sorry, if they do waive their Miranda rights and make a statement, and some of those statements can be very inculpatory in towards of, you know, maybe even full outright admitting to the behavior they're accused of, what defense attorneys can do is file a motion to see if they were competent to make that waiver. And that actually comes in the form of what's called a suppression hearing, in which the defense is arguing in front of the court that because the defendant now at this time didn't fully appreciate the Miranda warning and what that meant to waive that, that they should uh, suppress any statements made after that. So if successful, they can actually remove the ability of the prosecution from even bringing up statements made by the defendant to the police during, let's say, an interrogation. And just to put this into context, we're, we're going to tell you about a, a, 
an important white paper that came out of the ARC, but a study cited in that white paper um, investigated a large group of participants with intellectual developmental disabilities. And the Miranda statement has four sort of main concepts in it. They, they explained those concepts and then they questioned, they had people answer questions about it. And in this study, 67% of their participants failed to understand at least one of the four separate parts of Miranda. So this just suggests to us that this is a relevant forensic issue for folks with um, intellectual and developmental special needs. Absolutely. And actually the research suggests that it's not widely raised. Um, courts are very hesitant uh, to suppress statements after a suspect has been Mirandized. Um, and so I've been involved in a, a handful of these evaluations over the years, but I've, I've never been involved in a case where even when I opine that the person, in my opinion, was not competent to waive their Miranda rights, did the court actually agree with me? And so it's, it's, a, it's a high bar for the courts to ultimately suppress those statements. Probably the most common forensic issue that comes before, certainly that Dr. Bundy and I are asked to evaluate is competency to stand trial. And so this basically uh, occurs in the current, you know, their contemporary functioning um, during the trial process. And that is actually presented in a pretrial hearing in front of the judge. And so we'll say more about all these concepts as we go along. And then let's say that the individual is in fact convicted of the offense, then two additional uh, you know, issues can come before the court. One is called mitigation of penalty, which is essentially um, evaluating the current and previous function of that individual in order to provide information to the court that may um, present the defendant in a more sympathetic light. Uh, with the purposes of being evaluated for sentencing. So this may come in the form of a report that the, the, the defense hires a doctor, does the evaluation, that report is then sent to the prosecutor in order to perhaps establish a better offer, maybe even before the trial for the purposes of a plea bargain. But it can also come in the form of a pre-sentence investigation and even a pre-sentence hearing in front of a judge. And even in the last year, I did one of these in federal court in Lexington, in which I formed an opinion that the defendant in that case had a mild intellectual developmental disability, and that the court would want to perhaps take that into consideration when um, thinking through this guy's sentence. And then kind of built into this, this is really is in some ways a separate but also related issue is a, is a risk assessment. And that could be a risk assessment for violence, or it can also be uh, a, sex, uh, a sexual acting out or a sexual offender risk assessment, depending on the type of case. And this is an assessment that really covers the whole span of the individual. So we're looking at their current functioning, but also looking at previous functioning and the current paradigms for risk assessment also focuses on future functioning. So we want to think about risk management and what things can we put into place to mitigate one's risk for future uh, violence or sexual um, acting out. And again, this can come in the form of a report to the prosecutor, a pre-sentence investigation, or a pre-sentence hearing in front of the court. Dr. Bundy, do you want to say anything else before we move on? I don't see that we have any questions. I guess the questions are supposed to go the, we, the we questions questions go in the, the Q and A box. If you hover at the bottom of your screen, I'm watching for them. We don't have anything yeah, yet. We don't have any. Okay, I, I, I guess encourage we're, attendees to put it in there. Put their questions. We're perfectly in clear. How about we go with that hypothesis? <laughs> so let's let's break down each of these in a lot more detail, so you have a sense for what's going on at these various stages. So again, we make no assumptions of someone doing the offense, but let's talk about it as if they had committed the offense uh, for which they are charged. And so this issue of insanity or criminal responsibility, or in some uh, jurisdictions, it's referred to as mental state at the time of the offense, an MSO evaluation. 
Um, this is really uh, one of the more controversial topics in, in the criminal justice system because people in the uh, community view this as a uh, get out of jail free card, uh, you know, a pass for the defendant to not be found responsible for criminal behavior. But in actuality, what ends up happening um, to individuals found not guilty by reason of insanity, they can off, often end up serving longer periods of time in supervised uh, facilities than had they been found guilty of the offense um, them, you know, in, by the courts. So essentially what we think about of is insanity, we, we go back to these two terms that um, are really important and foundational in our criminal justice system, actus reus and mens rea. So actus reus is essentially Latin, whoops, uh, sorry, uh, for um, a guilty act. So the person commits a guilty act, but they have to have a guilty mind. So when you think about, if, you, if you've ever watched Law and Order or any of these cop shows, right? Or, or, you know, legal dramas, they're always saying, what's the motive, right? When, when they're thinking about criminal motive, they're really getting at mens rea. What was the intent behind the individual uh, when the guilty act uh, occurred? And so that, as, as you probably know, there are many ways of considering intent in our criminal justice system. For example, not every homicide case is a murder case. We think about different levels. There can be something called murder, manslaughter, um, accidental death, uh, reckless, you know, if the person was engaged in reckless behavior that resulted. So all of these different levels of intent are built into the system for examining uh, the culpability level of that defendant based on their intent at the time. So the insanity defense is one that explicitly looks at the mens rea, the, the, the mindset of the individual. And a lot of folks think, well, that just means that they were crazy at the time. And so these terms like crazy, these more pejorative descriptions of a person's mental state get thrown around. And other kind of you know, like, you know, another idea about this is that, you know, the individual was psychotic. And, and if they have, let's say, a condition like schizophrenia or, or a psychotic condition, that that essentially equates to insanity. But I want to make clear that insanity is not a psychiatric term. You will not find the term insanity in the DSM or any you know, ICD or any other kind of diagnostic manual. Insanity is a legally defined term that is different from psychosis. Um, and so, you know, it's really important that, you know, the diagnosis itself is only one part of a successful insanity defense. Um, the other thing that, that kind of comes out, and this really came out after Hinckley, uh, John Hinckley was convicted, or I'm sorry, was um, found not guilty of reason, by reason of insanity in the assassination attempt of President Reagan. Um, a, a lot of states shortly thereafter, this is like 1981, 82, enacted what's called guilty but mentally ill as a way of being found guilty but the court recognizing that the individual's mental illness played a role in the defense. And so now many states, including Kentucky, where, where Dr. Bundy and I practice, have not only a guilty, not guilty, but a not guilty by reason of insanity and a guilty but mentally ill uh, outcome. So Dr. Wagon, my yeah. first job in the correctional system you probably remember me telling you about this, was in the South Carolina system. They have this possibility of this GBMI verdict and all the folks convicted under that label came into a psychiatric facility inside the prison system and were evaluated and treated before they had the option to request typical population right. setting. So that's what I did. I, I saw all those folks coming in and evaluated them. 
Yeah. I actually had an interesting experience. My first time in a, in a trial testimony in a case where I formed an opinion that the defendant had an intellectual disability and that that intellectual disability impacted their mental responsibility, you know, their mental um, state at the time of the offense, the jury actually produced a deadlocked result in which two of the 12 jurors decided NGRI and 10 of the 12 jurors decided GBMI. And so that ended up producing a, uh, you know, a, a deadlocked jury and, and a um, mistrial in that case. 